Okay, well, first of all, welcome everyone. It's really good to see so many people here, and thank you for turning out on a really beautiful evening. My name's Sally Campbell. Uh, I've been a resident, full-time resident on Aaron since 2004. And uh, despite my English accent, I am married to a Campbell, which almost makes me legit. What we want is to start to put together some really clear thoughts about what the residents want of their ferry. Just not this year, but strategically thinking about Aaron for the future and how we are going to uh, manage living here, encouraging tourism and so on, and yet as residents having a say and a clear say in what we want. What I'm going to do now is to ask everyone up here to introduce themselves. And I hope that as a result of this evening, you will all go away feeling that A, you've been listened to, B, you have some clear strategic suggestions that a group might carry forward on your behalf. Well, good evening. My name's Chris Atkins. I've lived here for 21 years, and obviously I have concerns about the ferry, but I'm not here to talk about my concerns tonight. We're all here to listen to yours. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name's Gavin Fulton. I'm from Lamlash. I was born in Lamlash. I've lived here all my life, and I'm just fed up with the ferry like most other people. A, a little point I'd like to make here, but it's an important point, that we're not here to criticise the CalMAC staff who are unfailingly polite and helpful under what must be bloody difficult circumstances sometimes. And, and neither are we here to criticise other people, some of whom may be present, who have given up time over the years to serve in various committees and, and have maybe been hitting their head off a brick wall against the powers that be. So I think it's important that we're not here to look back and see what's not been done. We're here to look forward. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, my name's Ross McLean. Uh, I was brought up in Corrie. Uh, I've returned to the island about, after about 20 years away. Uh, we bought the Sanex Bay Hotel, amongst other buildings, to renovate. Um, and we're quite concerned about the ferry because its impact upon hotels is not good at the moment. Um, but as Gavin says, we're pretty much grouped together here to listen to what folk have got to say so we can hopefully carry forward some positive suggestions um, to CalMAC and the powers that be and get the powers that be to listen to the island. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is John Ford. I've been a resident of uh, La Cranza for 11 years, uh, and I'm a fr frequent user of the fer ferry and many times exasperated over the conditions which we have to suffer here. And I hope that this meeting and the people who are co collaborating with it can produce a solution that is, improves the situation for all the residents, all the residents, I should say. I'm here as a result of discussions within the Community Council which didn't come to a successful conclusion. I'm here particularly, like the rest, to hear what you've got to say, and my speciality tonight is Brodick Pier and Adrossan Harbour. Some of the others will be dividing themselves over the other issues, ferry timetables, etc. Uh, my name is Robert Cumming. I live in La Cranza and I'm the secretary of the La Cranza and Catico Community Association. My only reason for this tonight is because I think you, the public in Ireland, need a voice, and I'm, sadly, you've been denied it. Tonight's your opportunity not to argue, but to work constructively to see if we can really achieve something and some change for the better with the powers that be. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ken Thorburn. I, like Robert, live in the Royal Borough of Lochranza and proud of it. I'm chairman of the local village association and I'm here as a member of this team tonight. So we're going to start with the harbour and terminal building. So if anyone has a, a, an, a suggestion for a strategic way forward for our harbours and terminal buildings, let's hear it. Uh, yes, my name's Colin Milne. I've lived on the island six years. It may be appropriate to record that I spent 24 years in the Royal Navy, during which time I commanded two minor war vessels and was second in command of a frigate. So I do actually know a bit about harbours, ship handling, and seamanship generally. Um, 
I would love to talk about uh, Brodick, but it, that boat has sailed, <laughs> metaphorically. But our Drossen is critical. Up till now, up till the opening of the new facilities at Brodick, our Drossen was a limiting factor for the reliability of our service. And it's absolutely critical, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that the developments at our Drossen are correctly handled so that they allow better reliability at that end. I think uh, the key issue is clearly when there are strong westerly winds which uh, affect swell at the uh, Ardrossan end. There are two ways of mitigating that. One is by building a breakwater which would probably be prohibitively expensive and the other is to improve the size of the manoeuvring area within uh, the breakwaters at Brodick. Um, if you've got a strong swell following you in, the prudent seaman-like thing to do is to actually enter the harbour at a reasonable speed so that you've got steerage way and that implies that you've got to have a significant dredged area internally in the harbour to allow you to stop and turn safely before running aground. So peel ports need to invest heavily in dredging a lot further into the harbour. The second view I have is that the alignment of the uh, berth uh, up to the uh, link span needs to be altered to also allow greater manoeuvring room. I would suggest it needs to be parallel to the Irish berth, i.e. chopping off the uh, area which is currently used for, uh, well, not much used at all, which would allow more manoeuvring room for a vessel coming in. And I think that would reduce the risk of, for instance, collisions with the jetty. It would allow more manoeuvring space and better uh, approach, final approach to the link span. Thank you very much. I'm Jim Climey from Whiting Bay. Came here in 1966. As you said, we're stuck with this pier. We're not stuck with Ardrossan yet. And I'd like to ensure that no passenger has to climb more than the rise and fall of the tide to get on the ship. Here it's ridiculous, low tide, you have to climb up, climb down, same if you're going the other way. We don't want that to happen at a drossing. It must be kept low level. Thank you very much, actually. I think that's a key thing, which is about enabling all our community to access the boats easily. Uh, there has been quite a lot of thought around about those who... Uh, are either elderly or have a disability or who actually don't like walking up high. I mean, there are all sorts of issues. And most of us are very, like to be independent, uh, find it quite difficult to ask for help. So uh, seeing people struggle with suitcases and so on is quite difficult. So thank you for that. Hello, good evening. My name's Ian Ferguson. I'm an architect, or was an architect on the island, and I've been heavily involved with the ferry for a very long time. In fact, we've had meetings for years about this, uh, this ferry. The ferry terminal, as far as we're concerned, is a disaster. Uh, it was quite un unnecessary to build something so big. However, what we are now faced with is making the maximum and best use of it. And this, is to, this concerns access. Access from the ground level to the first floor level um, is poor because the steps are really too steep. And secondly, there are only two lifts. Now, in the brief, um, CML told us that the lifts, each lift was capable of housing 13 people, and that's the figure inside the lift. In point of fact, if you're in a wheelchair with a helper and somebody else with a buggy, you can get two people into the lift. So the lift access is, in excess, is, 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 is useless. Uh, disability, which is a point that Sally Campbell was making, um, is very poor. I'm partially disabled and I have difficulty getting on and off the boat down the long walkway. I think this is something else which has been very poorly thought out and is something which needs to be addressed. In addition, you've got this rise and fall of the tide problem with the ramps going up and down. Uh, the ticketing is crazy because if you go, if you want to use, get your tickets and you want to go to the lift, to, to, to the stairs, you've got to turn around and go back again. If you want to go to the lift, you go straight on. So there's a, there's a, a, a crossing issue. The one thing that could be improved greatly would be to, if to bring the buses closer to the terminal because the buses at present are too far away from the terminal. They could easily be put where the drop-off point 
of the right next to the building where people could actually see them and have a chance of actually getting them. Always access seems to be an issue. Access of the boats into harbours, but also access for us as residents onto the boats and off the boats. And I think that that has been well noted and will be uh, thought about. The, the, the old pier was exposed to easterly winds, but it was relatively unaffected because the boat lay stern on. Therefore, the, the length of the wave in relation to the length of the boat wasn't significant. The new pier, the boat is turned round, beam on, sideways onto the sea. And the pier is not a breakwater, it's a pier. The waves roll underneath the pier. Therefore, the, the boat rolls in the berth, it then snaps ropes, it pulls away from the, the access system, and it twists the car deck ramp. Now, it really doesn't matter which side of the pier you sit on, it's still going to roll. They should have built it in breakwater form. They didn't. The only option now is to build a rubble breakwater. I don't know how realistic or practical that is. But at the moment, if we get a sustained period of, say, 18 to 20 mile an hour, 20 mile an hour plus easterlies, the boat will not be able to sit there and will be marooned. That really brings us on to uh, the next item, which is port of refuge. And I wonder if those of us who remember going to Guruk uh, have any thoughts about a port of refuge. Because, as has been stated, it seems that whichever way the wind is blowing hard, it causes us difficulties now. So has anyone any thoughts on the port of refuge? Hello, I, my name is John McDonald. I've stayed here all my life. Now, I know we've got additional problems with what's happened at Brodick, the infrastructure we lack of investment in vessels, but this, this, the main problem still with reliability is Adrosan Harbour. Now, I'm not qualified. Hopefully, if they do up Adrosan the right way, it might be better. But should they not look the, the closest port of refuge, I can remember fairly, it seemed like that is not any more, and it's a different day. You could be at a Drossen, blow in a hooli, you go up to Fairley. So Hunterson is not getting used, so I'm told. Now, could they not put a port of refuge in at Hunterson? Once it gets to 45 mile an hour, you'll go up to Hunterson, no bother. Uh, they don't need to do anything fancy, they need a pier, a link span, they don't need any fancy offices, and that is the main problem with reliability is addressing Harbour. Uh, we're just going to show a short video now, which I, I, might be difficult to see at the back. Uh, I was stranded in the mainland, courtesy of Calmac, and I had a bit of time in my hands, so I thought, well, I'll just go up to Guruk and see what's happening up there. And uh, as those of you who've lived here long enough and been to Guruk, like myself, plenty of times, you'll know it's pretty sheltered up there. So we'll show the video and then I'll, I'll say a few words about it. So here we are at Guruk. Quarter past one on Saturday, just read the latest dispatch from CalMac saying that, you know, conditions are such that the Caledonian Isles can't bear here, that the safety of their passengers is paramount in this position. This current period of severe weather, as you can see, it's possibly blowing 12 to 15 knots here. The um, conditions are clear, sunny. The local Argyle ferries are coming to and fro, a little bit of swell out in the channel, but nothing really remarkable as to why you couldn't bring the Caledonian Isles in here, who knows. So um, that made me so mad, I spent a bit of time trying to work out why we're took told the boat or why the boat doesn't go to Guruk. Now I don't have the definitive answer but I think I've got a fair idea. Uh, Guruk Harbour is not manned. They, there are plenty of office workers there but there's no rope catchers, no car marshals, no ticket sellers. So if the master decides I'm going to Guruk and it's the master's decision, you also need somebody from Kalmai ashore authorising the and organising the staff from Adrosan to be bussed up there and you also have somebody has to break it to Argyle Ferries that their timetable for the day is going to be shredded. So there's quite a lot of inertia to overcome for that boat to go up the river. And I just don't think there's any real good reason why it couldn't go there a few times. I know there's days when the boat shouldn't sail and we'd all agree with that, but there's plenty of times when it's tied up and I don't think it's justified.
Hello, my name's Helena Paul. Um, I live at King's Cross. I've been there a little less than a year, um, and I'm delighted to make Aaron my home. I also want to run a business here, which will be heavily dependent on the ferry. Um, so I very much hope and wish you every success with what you're doing. One of the things that I find deeply frustrating is the lack of data and statistics that seem to be available. Now, it may be that I can't find them, um, or they're buried somewhere, and there is a secret place where you can find the reliability statistics of the ferry because certainly in the short time I've been here my perception is it has got much worse um, I've heard today that there's a problem with the lift on board the Caledonian Isles and um, it seems that you know, with the ageing fleet that we have as we all know um, there is a clear difficulty with, with keeping these boats actually running um, but I'm very concerned that actually we don't really know what the reliability statistics are, our perception is it's very very poor but I would very much like to see um, you get a daily update on the, on the website but there seems to be no record kept of that and I think it would be certainly a laudable aim to start with if you could actually get meaningful statistics and actually have these published on a regular basis. Thank you. Hello, Lena. Just, thank you. Just to help you on that, the CalMac website have detailed, it's part of the contract actually, they've got detailed information on sailings and uh, cancelled sailings. I can summarise that quite shortly. In 2018, CalMac had 601 cancelled sailings to Arran on the two routes. But if you, if you mine down into the CalMac website, uh, and you probably have to put freedom of information in and start studying some of the... In I know it's, it's, it's quite convoluted, but the information is in there, Lena. So, um, and if you want to come to the table after the meeting, I can certainly guide you on that. Thank you. Hello, my name's Sam Bourne, lived on the island nearly three years, um, and sadly looking around the room I may be one of the youngest here, that's a yeah. shame. That's a shame. Um, Absolutely. Coming on to the point of Troon as a port of refuge, um, seems a bit odd to me, I'm a you know, background in, in, in uh, sailing um, in the sea since I was very young, but it seems a bit odd to me as a port of refuge to be a two and a half hour sailing time up the Clyde, whereas it's a port of refuge, it's a last minute call, whereas Troon is only an hour and a bit as a port of refuge. It's not going to be your regular service, but as a port of refuge, Troon appears a far better solution to get a more regular port of refuge service. Thank you very much. So there are some clear thoughts that this needs to be rethought, that having nowhere to go in, in extremis is not good enough. So that's a... a something that has been noted here. Um, my name's Kelly Price. I've lived here all my life. Um, why don't we use the port that Rossi used at Weems Bay? They've fully manned. It's not having to drag CalMac staff in from anywhere else. It's got a hideous walkway that we have now as well. There's no reason why we can't use that port. Our boat would fit in there with no problems because they've done the port up. I know Kate's an hour, hour and a half up the Clyde, not quite as far as Gurick, but it would still get us somewhere that we can get a train to Glasgow. Just to answer the question of the port of refuge, there's a great deal of pressure being put on CalMac now to explain the, the lack of interest that they have in Gurick. There are several different stories or versions of the story, but be rest assured that the figures that we have produced will be used to lever Gulak back into business and in the longer term we want to see whether or not a ship could be built which would fit the Weems Bay Pier. At this moment Calmac and Seamal and the others are finding it difficult to decide what ships to build because of the delay in the finishing of our Glen Sanox. And there is a view now that the Glen Sanox may never come to the Aran Run. There are many reasons for this concern with the cost of altering a Drossen. She's also got the sensitivity of Brodick, which is going to be a lot more for a bigger ship. So the issue is, who is going to guide the Scottish office in deciding what size of ships we need for the future? Yes, there is a proposal to build six smaller ships all identical, and to modify all the terminals up the west coast so that those ships will fit any terminal any time. The advantages of this are quite obvious. In addition to everything else, the cost of six ships is a lot less 
than a cost of six individual ships. So that's the stage we're at. Our job sitting here is to push hard with the people who will make the decisions and try and lead them into the decision. We're not going to shout at them. We're going to ask them common sense to prevail. Thank you. Someone here? Last one, and before we okay. move on to the next item. Richard Wright, also from Lochranza, been here 20 years and many years uh, prior to that. I don't know how constructive this comment's going to be, but I was a civil engineer in my past life before I came to Arn and had my own practice. Um, I was also then fortunate to, when I did retire, work for North Ayrshire Council as Assistant Island Officer. Probably the best and worst job I've ever had. But I've got the contrast of both types of business. And I know we've said the boat has already sailed, and this probably applies to our ferry. It should have been privatised, or there should have been an opportunity. I know Calmike won the ports, I know they won the piers, but until there's some competition, and they've got a wee bit of uh, um, aggravation from others, committees don't design anything. That's been proved by the, uh, the Brodick Pier. That's designed by committee. And that's what you get. So I think we should consider, if it's at all possible, in the future, I'm not talking with the short to medium term, but I'm talking the long term. Look at Western Ferries. They seem to provide a great service to Dunoon. We need to get some sort of edge onto this and get some sort of competition into the market, although we, the rest of us they basically sit in the thumbs. So I don't think that's particularly constructive, but there lies the main problem. And if we go up with that problem, which I know with the ports is probably impossible, we'd probably start to get some sort of service that looks after us. Okay, thank, thanks. Thank you very much for that. There's, there's such a thing as political will, and I suspect that we all hope in this room that we can exert something on political will as a result of this meeting. And so it will be up to all of us to actually think strategically as to what in 10 years' time we want to see here. Not just, well, let's get through the summer, but let's have a, a further view, a longer view. I'm delighted to hear that Port of Refuge is to some extent back onto the agenda because it seems to have gone very low key in the last few years. Can I have a name? Uh, my name is David Baker. Both of us uh, have reasonably regular occasion to go off the island and travel. Onward travel is very often booked well ahead. And when the ferry, uh, particularly obviously during the winter, when the ferry is uncertain whether it's going to sail, one keeps looking at the forecast. We have both been known to have to leave or feel we have to leave three days beforehand in order to get our flight wherever we're going. Now that, it seems to me, is an extremely good reason for uh, re-looking at the Guruk or, or some other genuine port of refuge. In the old days, you could at least get off uh, yep. every day, yep. even if it was only one ferry. Thank you very much. I think that's a pertinent point. Yep. I, think, I think many of us would say that uh, we didn't used to have to watch what was happening to the ferry hour by hour in case something happened. So that's a good point to uh, close that on. And perhaps next, next we'll move on to booking and ticketing. How many of you have had uh, an urgent um, hospital appointment or business appointment, shall we say, um, on the mainland and you're having to book, say two weeks in advance even now to be sure of some meeting that appointment and, they only, and to be told no I'm sorry you, 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 there's no, it's completely full up it's just absolutely hopeless there's no way you can get on you know? but if you go into the unbooked queue then there might be a chance that you can meet your appointment but we can only tell you um, three o'clock before the previous day whether you're going to get on or not so okay yes, that's all you can do you go along uh, and, you, uh, and you keep your fingers crossed eventually uh, through the kindness of the Calmac uh, port staff you do actually get on the boat and lo and behold you've got one deck is completely empty 
what what the hell what's going on here you know but this you have, we have a booking system which is completely not fit for purpose um i i note also that many of you uh, like me are probably in the aged category uh, and you've you've booked your passage uh, and you've arrived at the port um picked your uh, Brodick port picked your car ticket up but you can't actually can't actually book a concession uh, ticket for the as a driver and unless you sort of park the car get out of the car go into the main booking office get the ticket walk back up to the to the control booth give your ticket in walk back to the car which is very not very convenient if it's actually blowing a hooli and pouring of rain and I've been complaining about this for the last two years and nobody does anything at all but you could they have a ticketing machine if you go on the on the Le Cranza to Clonig Ferry where they can do it there and then um, uh, though also you may notice at Ardrossan they can take you to concession tickets there and then this seems to be covering all sorts of those niggly issues that we have not now, fit for purpose in other words uh, something needs obviously to be renovated or newly designed so that there is a better process for ticketing and for making sure that in an emergency you know it's very difficult to go in and say i need i need my car on tomorrow to which they say well you should have booked two weeks ago well actually they hadn't died so i think there are some key issues whether it be health or whether it be for family occasions that in fact there needs to be some reform which needs to be taken up at the highest level uh, Calmac actually in there they will say when I wrote to them that in the uh, the contract they have they are not allowed to give priority to people who live on the island um, and I think that needs to be changed and so that needs some political lobbying and a, a, a mindset change of, uh, and again, we're back to some political will, aren't we? Now, ticketing has been a problem all over the Western Isles, and I quote you from the Mull meeting last month. Provision for a modern ticketing system was included in the contract submission by Carmack in 2016. But as yet, the government have not provided the funds for the investment. So it wasn't Karl Marx's fault. They engaged in a contract in which they received a promise, and the promise by the government has not been kept. We will try and do something about that. Hopefully when they get the new ticketing system in, they'll be able to scan our ferry card numbers rather than have to punch them in, which over the whole Karl Marx set up, they must have hundreds of man hours. The problem is there's no barcode on a ferry ticket on a ferry card so we must start now and from now on all ferry cards should have a barcode on them so that when they get the new ticketing system they can scan the card and save time thank you thank you hello um, i'm dave thompson um, i've lived here a number of years uh, on on the ferry card why is it not the same size as all the credit cards every other card i've got and then it doesn't fit into your stupid wallet <laughs> even the Scottish card for uh, bus journeys is a credit card size so that's the first thing the second thing is I, I go off island regular to pick up my boy uh, uh, he stays with his mother so there's quite a few people on England who the, they have to do a change over at weekends for their partners uh, and it's unless we book week in, weeks in advance we can't go on the boat if I suddenly find out I have to look after my boy and I've got to go to Dumfries to get him and I can't go on the boat that puts everything up in the air the problem is there's not enough capacity on the boat the only way to, uh, to meet the demand is to have more capacity instead of a boat that takes 120 vehicles there'd be better with two boats that take 80 vehicles and run them simultaneously like they do in the summer opposite timetables. When we're talking about having six ferries the same, two of them should be for our run. Forget a huge big boat. 
get two smaller boats, but the combined capacity would be, say, 160, 120, then we wouldn't be talking about half of these problems. It's a capacity that's wrong. In a past life, I was chairman of the Ferry Committee for Canada. Yeah, yeah. And in the past, together with Robbie Brown and Laurie Sinkler, who was the managing director of Colmac at that time, we had the arrangement that the freight people got 80 metres. And if they didn't take it up by 4 o'clock, they cried, they had Calmac had a waiting list, which they've dispensed with now, and all those people on the list were then phoned to say 20 metres of space or whatever it happened to be has become available. So then you would know that you could get on the ferry. They've disbanded, I believe, that whole system now, but it worked very well in the past. Um. Sorry, Colin Milne again. It seems to me exactly the point that uh, Ken Thorburn has just made. There's no visibility for us as ordinary citizens as to exactly how they allocate the uh, freight. Uh, and they clearly get significant priority. Uh, but on the Stornoway to Alapool run, there is an overnight freight run. And if you clear all the heavy freight, perhaps just by putting in on a 6 o'clock sailing from Brodick, to shift all the freight off and they can have as much capacity as they want, make it exclusive freight, then the, the ordinary people will get first dibs on the 820 sailing every day. Thank, thank you, Colin. That's a, that's a very good point. I'm not sure how the hauliers would feel, but however... Integrated transport will obviously be an issue anyway, but I think the public relations of CalMac and their way of providing us with information about sailings is inadequate. And they must know more than half an hour before that they're not going to sail. And it does seem to me that there's a problem with how do you communicate quickly with your prime passengers when there's a disruption. And I think that's a key issue. Okay, let's move on to ships. Ah, oh, ships. We all are waiting for this mythical ship to sail over the horizon to solve all our problems. Has anyone thought about the strategy for, for ships? We have heard one or two comments around the room about perhaps getting... A, a set, as Bob has said, you know, get some ships all the same type so that they're interchangeable. And it does seem one of the problems is about how we manage that with the politicians and with the money, money bags. Uh, so has anyone got some thoughts on that about a strategy for the future? Can somebody perceive what the current situation is with the Glen Sanex? Well, there's a news report. I don't know if we've got it up on the board. Um, the, the minister in, the, in Holyrood, has, or the transport minister, has announced that the Glen Sanex will not be um, here in time for June. There's no deadline or date being given, but um, that's all we know just now, that the Glen Sanex probably won't be here for June. Um, and that's all I can, can add to that. <laughs> Sorry, no surprise there. Sam Bourne, Lam Lash again. Uh, Part of my background is a naval architect, so I'm fairly well placed to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, strikes me, uh, you go onto Seamail's website, you look at their fleet facts. Uh, straight away, I think off the top of my head, I actually did the, uh, looked at it the other night, there's something like seven or eight of the large vessels that are already over 20 years old. Does anyone drive a car that's over 20 years old? <laughs> okay, one. Not many. 20 to 25 years lifespan for one of these boats, the amount of work they get is, is pretty exceptional. Um, there are some boats, the Isle of Arran and others, that are already 35 years old heading on for it. So it's, you know, you're talking crazy. Um, I used to live in Oban. I remember the, the Klansman when it was delivered new, and I worked out the other day, well, that was 1996. That's already over 20 years old. Um, the idea suggested to, to build a series fleet of boats is infinitely sensible <laughs> because the, 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 the economies of scale, um, you build six boats the same, you tool up, you could probably build six boats for the price of three one-offs, probably even two one-offs. Um, 
You could then have boats that interchange between different routes. We're now in the situation where we'll probably end up with a boat that may or may not ever sail here um, that could only ever operate this route or the UIG route because it needs the LNG fuel. So it can't go to Isla. It can't go to Oban. It can't go to Ullapool, um, which strikes me as pretty crazy. In the north with the Ullapool uh, Stornoway route with the Loch Seaforth, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but all of the advice to that point was to build two smaller ships to have a more regular service between the two. So they went and built a 120 metre boat that can only operate on that one route that offers half the service. So the idea of having multiple smaller ships that can go in multiple different places built in a simultaneous run, probably in a Scottish government owned shipyard, um, or in fact, take it somewhere else. it seems eminently logical and is the only way you're going to solve this problem. Thank you. David Brookins, I live in Whiting Bay. I'd like to just follow on from uh, what my immediate predecessor uh, mentioned there about two smaller boats. Uh, if that was the received wisdom for Stornoway Ullapool, and I've travelled that route frequently uh, when I was still working, I remember it was also the received wisdom for Aaron uh, to Ardrossan until somebody got the idea to build as a cruise liner. Uh, why on earth they abandoned the two vessel uh, suggestion, uh, I do not know. I've yet to meet anybody on the island or on the mainland who sails on the route who thinks that was a good idea. The reason I make the point now is it's quite negative, I know, but I wonder what gives us any confidence to take such sensible suggestions as are being made tonight to the same people that decided to build a cruise liner, which is totally unsuitable uh, for the route that's being designed for. Thank you. I, that, that is a, a very good point. Hello there, uh, Leslie Lockhart. I just wonder, in this power structure sheet here, I, I've got no, who actually makes the decisions about something like the, the boats, whether it's two or one, or who are the, the actual decision makers? The Scottish government basically does it. But the Scottish government has a political issue and parties change and the nominated transport minister or islands minister usually is left carrying the can. As far as it goes, we as an island have now met the minister for transport on at least three occasions in the last 12 months. And the last meeting was last week and we are waiting anxiously to find out whether the meeting last week gave us anything more than two, f- two ferry service over the last few days and the next few days. The matter is very important and has a different aspect because every island now wants two ferries. And the anger that is generated in Isla because Aaron gets their second ferry whenever Aaron loses a ferry is considerable and has been reported in the Herald quite frequently. The Mull people are in exactly the same position. Their service has deteriorated. They have statistics to prove that their service has deteriorated. And they have met with Carl Mack who have said the ships are too old. We can't do anything about it. So at the end of the day, the pressure from here and the other islands needs to be put together to get through to the top of Holyrood. That will be done and is being done and rest assured that we will not stop till we get somewhere. Thank you. My name's Douglas Coulter. I'm from Lochranza, another one. You have got two items on this sheet. You've separated them out, understandably. Uh, One is harbours and terminal buildings, harbours in particular. The second one is ships. These two should be considered together. One should be dependent on the other. Don't work out a system for the harbours and then, oh, instead of do, we did that for one boat, but now we've decided to change to two. The two have to be worked out in conjunction and certainly over the long term. The question of ships and ports together is obvious. It is being attended to. It has been for hundreds of years. But the differences are, for instance, if the Glensannocks didn't come here and two smaller ships came, would we need to spend 20 million or more at Adrossen? Would we need to spend very much at Adrossen? So the issue is very current because Adrossen is going to cost a lot of money to match what the Glensannocks needs. And if we could go away from 
gas-powered ships, which seem to be very sensitive to ordinary ships, which are smaller, then that would be a sensible answer to the question, we think. And my job as the part of the group here about Adrosan Harbour does consist of discussions about ships, not necessarily the harbour alone. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Hazel Gardner. I am also from Lochranza. One of my ancestors was a former uh, pier builder. Um, and uh, so really what I want to say is that regardless of politics, the ferry is a lifeline service for the island. And as such, it needs to run in such a way that it meets the needs of islanders, whether you're from an island family or whether you've come to live and work here. My point is that as such, if we know, uh, picking up on another point, that the ferries should be replaced every 20 years, why should we not have a fund that puts into that replacement at the same time as we are replacing the stock, a fund that is not political because this is a lifeline service and regardless of which government is in power, for a lifeline service for island people, provision should be made and there's plenty of money there, even in the oil, never mind anything else, there's plenty of money there to invest in the people um, who rely on that lifeline service. What do you consider to be a lifeline service for islanders? What do you consider? Is it about resilience, reliability, cost, uh, getting your car on? I mean, we, we need to actually have a very clear idea about what we mean by a, a lifeline ferry for the island because it's a bit like sustainability. There are 940 different definitions and we need to make sure our politicians and we are quite decided about what that means for the future. Hello, I'm John Kelso from Shiskin. I had experience of sailing in the West Coast, albeit skipper of a small coaster. So people talk of swell, they want to go around Malin Head on a 200 ton coaster. But anyway, the, the skippers that I knew on the Arden previous service always said if a new pier was to be built at Brodick, never build it facing Millport. So the brains do the face at Millport. If you look where the stern of the ferry is at the moment, obviously there's deep water there. You could have gone out to there and then done a hammerhead pier parallel with the old pier and that would have done away with the swell thing. As regards Ardrossan, I served my apprenticeship in Ardrossan and I sailed in and out in my coaster and there's no difference I found between in heavy weather Ardrossan and Troon. So it's a pick of fire. But at the time when I was there, Shell Mets tankers came into Ardrossan one and a half times the size the Cali Isles. But the inner or the outer harbour inside the breakwater was constantly dredged. And there was a resident tug there, the Ard Neil. And the, the Shell Mex berth was straight, you would pass Winton Pier straight ahead. The off charge there, and then the tug pulled them back, canted them in the outer basin, and they sailed back out. Now, I've visited every port on the west coast that Calmac serve and none of them have a breakwater. So no matter what ship you put on, the idea of going into a drossing with that breakwater is going to be dodgy. The old hands in a drossing harbour when I was here said that the way into a drossing harbour was come inside Horse Island, up around the north of the breakwater, and down inside the outer basin. There are just two rocks there, that nowadays could be blasted out in 10 minutes, and that would give a, an all weather harbour at Drossen. Uh, Stuart Goff, I've been here for a long time. Um, 
you asked what a lifeline service should be. It seems to me that possibly what we need is ships that go as quickly as they can in as short a time. You'll notice that the time to cross that piece of water out there has never reduced uh, in 60 odd years. In fact, they used to be able to do it from Ardrossan to Brodick in about 33 minutes. Um, the ships are floating cafeterias. Do the smaller ships that are being suggested uh, include all the, the, the pigs and whistles, uh, the, the bars, the, 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 the cafes, uh, which is fine for tourists, I suggest, who are enjoying the sail as part of their holiday. But for us, getting to and from, it should be by the fastest method. Like the trains are getting faster, the buses are getting faster, the, the, you know, the cars are faster. That's my point. I really want to ask a question. My apologies if this sounds a little naive. But what is the barrier to extending the ferry day so that we could actually have more ferries every day? We've heard uh, countless issues, and we've all experienced them, of the uh, insufficient capacity on the existing uh, schedule. What is it that's stopping the schedule being increased? Is it simply the unreliable boats? In which case, can we therefore buy second-hand boats from somewhere else in the world until a decision has been made or hire them in. If it's not that, if it's something to do with staffing rosters, how can these issues be resolved so that actually the priority is given back to the people who use the ferry rather than the people who run the ferry? There are 34 people in the Canada Islands. They're, they're very much held to the working time regulations and if you're extending that service, they need to get another crew from somewhere to go on um, there have been discussions uh, with CalMAC directly. They just don't listen, unfortunately. We've asked if we can have two ferries running a shuttle, medium-sized ferries running a shuttle service, one starting at 5 a.m., finishing at 5 p.m., the other starting at 11 a.m., finishing at 11 p.m. At the busy part of the day, there'll, have, there'll be the two ferries, but you'll be able to get off the island at 5 in the morning and come back at 11, and there's no curfew. Unfortunately, as I think pretty much everybody in this room knows, CalMAC aren't very good at listening, which is what we're trying to do at this end of the table, and just take on board what everybody said and collate it and move things forward in a meaningful manner. Thank you. Um, in my alter ego, I used to fly public transport helicopters, uh, transporting uh, oil workers uh, from Aberdeen out to the oil rigs. And, of course, that operated from airfield opening to airfield closing time, 6 in the morning, till 22.30 at night. And, clearly, um, rostering of crews uh, to make maximum availability of the airframes was uh, our bread and butter. And I actually represented my colleagues as a BALPA official, and we negotiated rosters with our company. So if you need a bit of help in telling uh, Carl Mack, how to run a roster, I'm your man. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds like an a excellent offer, so thank you. Apart from cost, what are the problems in actually uh, hiring a ferry from elsewhere? We've done it. Um, we've, we've tried. Um, again, it's a, a problem with Carl Mack listening. Um, at, the, at the moment, we're suggesting that they look at the Munich or an equivalent freight ferry for Arne, which would take the freight off of the mezzanine, or oh, the problem with the mezzanine decks, um, and free up the car passenger places. The, obviously, a freight ferry is a lot cheaper than a Class 2A uh, passenger ferry. I mean, it, it, the difficulty is CalMAC aren't listening, which is one of the reassuring things standing at this end of the room, looking at, out at you guys and ladies, that we know we've got a body of people on the island that care about the ferry service, that have fed uh, suggestions across to this end, and that hopefully we can take things forward and at least get CalMAC to listen. And I think that's made the main problem. We'll move on to extending the Lochranza Clonic service. In the summer, we have an excellent service. I don't think there's any problem there. What we're trying to get is a reliable winter service and a proposal has already been received via the ferry committee
but it's not quite acceptable to their friends in Tarbert or to ourselves. So we're putting a counter-proposal to allow more travellers to have a longer period of time either on Argyle or on Loch Ranza. So we are waiting a response from that. And this is even more important now because of the level of disruption to the main service. And you can see cars speeding over the hill as though there was no tomorrow trying to catch a ferry. And the other interesting point I would like to make is that while traditionally Clonaig has never figured in the winter timetable when needs must on a camish day, it works. I'm just going to try and, and uh, draw this to an end, but the first thing I'd really like to say, I've been fascinated by tonight, in some quarters we were told this would be a rabble, that there would be less than 40 people here, but the hall, as you can see, is full. People have contributed in a great manner, and it's been very rewarding. But I have some questions. We've got together as nine people. We've funded and arranged this because we felt you people out there needed a voice in this. So I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions. And the first one is, on our behalf, is in terms of reliability, infrastructure, and accountability, could you tell us whether you think this service is fit for purpose by raising your hand? Do you, do you think that we are getting a good service? If you, if you don't think we're getting a good service, raise your hand. So if those that have raised their hands don't think they're getting a service that's fit for purpose. It was probably going to be a superfluous question anyway, but it was worth, <laughs> worth asking and worth recording. In, in calling this meeting, uh, we had a vision of where we would like to be. We had a vision of a new, a fresh, a progressive, and an apolitical lobbying organization that could be set up to represent our community's interests in ferry service issues. The remit would also include joining with other representatives up the west coast to form or try and form a West Coast Ferry Action Group. You know, this isn't just our problem. This problem extends right up the West Coast. And if we all get together, we could become a major political force. Um, we also need to make sure that pressure is brought to make sure that future investment in vessels and infrastructure is, in, is appropriate. In other words, we don't get another ferry terminal like we've got at the present time. The proposed action group would be properly constituted with members elected by the public. It would give an absolute guarantee to keep the public fully informed of its work and progress and respond to their ongoing concerns and suggestions. So basically what we're asking you tonight to finish up with is whether you would like us to try and go forward with a steering group to set up this organisation on the island of Arne. So if you think that's a good idea, perhaps you could put up your hands. So I think that's fairly unanimous that we should do something. And we would very sincerely look to people to come forward to be on the steering group. We would have a steering group and then we would have an annual, uh, annual general meeting of some sort, inaugural annual general meeting, and we set up a constitution. But anyone that really is interested and would like to join in a steering group, please let Chris Atkins, our secretary, know, uh, either tonight or whatever. Thank you very much and thank everybody.